Welcome everybody to the international lecture series of the spring uh, 2021 at uh, the Royal Danish Academy. Uh, this uh, lecture series is uh, the second part of uh, the lecture series under the title The Art of Analysis. Um, and uh, this um, lecture series is hosted by the Institute of Architecture and uh, Culture. I have been preparing uh, this um, lecture together with my good colleague, Ida Flarup. The art of analysis discuss architectural analysis in many different ways. As a tool for historical anchoring, a tool for social and societal progress, for urban adaption or even for artistic redemption. We do so through visits from internationally significant architects and scholars. During the coming 90 minutes, we will hear the lecture by today's guest, Swiss architect Aita Fluri. Following her lecture, we, will ha we have invited a professor uh, from our faculty, Nikolai Bo Andersen, to prepare questions that address the work of Aita Fluri uh, and uh, open a discussion on the relation between matters of architectural analysis. Uh, in the discussion, we will also include questions from the chat, so please get ready uh, to actively engage with your own considerations. Yeah, so it's my great uh, pleasure to introduce you to one of these uh, international significant architects. Eta Fluri studied architecture at the ETH Zurich and did her thesis by the Tuccino architect and professor Flora Rocat on Kati. The architecture from the region of Ticino has since the 1970s been internationally acclaimed for its ability to mediate between a local building tradition with historical reference to aesthetic discourses of contemporary architecture. This heritage does not seem unfamiliar to the architecture of tonight's <laughs> guests. Before starting her own practice, Aita Fluri has been working with Miley Peter Architecten and been involved in continuing education in the theory of design and in art and philosophy. Her work as a practicing architect has been thoroughly published in Swiss and international architectural media, and she has taught and lectures lectured at multiple renowned architectural institutions. Besides a built practice, Aita Fluri has also published several books as editor and as author. In the book, Cooperation, the Architect and the Engineer, published by Birkhäuser, she examines this intricate relation between the two professions inevitable in the realization of architecture. Another book, Elementaris Sum Raum, A Primer to Space, is one of the reasons why Aita Fluri is with us here tonight, as it has been a much appreciated by members of our faculty. In this book, Fluri concerns herself with the work of, uh, by a colleague, Roger Holzhauser, uh, whom have been the architect behind Rauchhaus, built from rammed earth, which has been an important reference in, for the academy through more than a decade. Mm. I had the pleasure to study the construction of House Biene uh, in the Swiss mm. town of Weinfelden together with the students at materials course last summer. A house clad in shingles and through which Flu re reflects on mass and structure in a small essay on her website. Her multifamily house, La Contenta in Doma Dems, is named with reference to the Palladian Villa Foscari La Malcontenta, and it was designed through an interest in its architecture. I hope it is clear by now that the work and career of Aita Fluri is truly that of a reflective practitioner, which has been the focus in the curation of this lecture series. We are honored to have you here and have been looking very much forward for tonight. So with this, uh, I will give the, the word to tonight's guest, uh, Ita Fluri and her lecture, Cultures of Transformation. Thank you for coming, Ita. Well, thank you very much for the very, very kind introduction. Uh, I don't know if I have much to add to it. No, I'm kidding. But you mentioned all or 
the most important built projects I did. And I'm really happy um, to be with you. As I told you before, it's a pity that I, we can't meet physically. It's quite strange to, to look into a computer, but we do the best out of it. And the art of analysis that you sent as a title, I, I frankly interpreted very freely. So um, I, I think basically it's about to talk what my work is about and what I think architecture revolves around. So maybe the next foil, please. I will try to make the main points within four very much summarized categories. And all shown examples could be discussed just as appropriate within the other categories. Next. So now one back, please. <laughs> Architecture and space, the first category. And um, this title, one could argue to be very unspecific and the two open titles since it appears obvious that architecture has to deal with space. Now please the next poem. But interestingly enough, the space term has been a topic since the antique, but for a long time it rests an abstract term within the field of philosophy or natural sciences. And only about 150 years ago, the Raumbegriff, as the term space, has become a subject of architectural theory. It was concretized, concretized for the first time in the art historical debates of the German aesthetic at the end of the 19th century. Architecture got into the context of psychology and it was what a coincidence, the young Swiss art historian Heinrich Wölflin, in his Prolegomena zu einer Psychologie der Architektur, talks about Raumerfahrung, which means the experience of space as a physical experience. So the self perceiving as a spatial bodily creature shifts in the center of the experience of architecture. And that was quite new. The main idea of, his, or of this theory is that in the medium of our feces, of our body, we experience spatial objects as related to us. So the experience of physical forces on our own body becomes the basic condition for us to experience other corporal objects. Uh, we are much more than only visually perceiving we sense by our whole body because through that body we get the know-how of load of contraction of force tension pressure etc and only through that we are enabled to sense the states of other shapes of forms of objects of space so 1950 until 53 luigi moretti published his magazine that he simply called spazio Therein, he finds a very concise method to visualize and render very clear on concrete examples some of the aspects of the art historical ideas that I talked before. I will get back to Moretti afterwards. It is then the 1977 published book by Rudolf Arnheim, The Dynamics of Architectural Form, that becomes very important to me. The perceptual psychologist presents a virtuosic school of seeing where he traces strong forms of expression and dormant physical forces. His theory is directly tried, tied to the keynotes of the theories of the end of the 19th century of the Einfühlungstheoretiker. The quality of expression of architectural form is a projection of body sensations. So Arnheim uh, very skillfully leads the observation, the view towards notable effects to make aware of the basic elements of space. And the great thing about Arnheim's book is that it focuses the categories of the pure sensation. That means the history of style or of epoch does not matter. 
it's about the pure unshowering foam. So he talks about verticality, horizontality, weight, lightness, emptiness, density, dynamic, immobility, solid, voids, etc. So finally, the book that was already mentioned in the introduction that I did 2008 together with Roger Boltzhauser, Primer to Space, is fundamentally connected and rooted in the three shown publications. We felt the need to bring back the focus to look at the effect of architecture. So the attention goes to how space or spatial forms appear what kind of effect they have on a human being. And as I said before, it's uh, always worth to repeat, by their physical experiences, every human being is able to understand the qualities of forms and accordingly is capable of developing a feeling for space. So everybody has a feeling of space, not only architects. And this is rooted in, our human condition and the fundamental circumstances that accompany that. So we have eyes 150 above ground or maybe nowadays a bit more. We do horizontal movements. We are lying down to sleep, etc. So as an architect, first and foremost, I have to know which architectural instruments cause what kind of sensations for the human being. Now we could have the next full. I make some examples. In his essay, Strutture e Sequenza dello Spazio, Luigi Moretti tries to analyze and visualize the qualities of space by using casts of internal spaces, as we called it, the hollow space or the negative space. He's convinced that the void this negative space is like a matrix of the real. The negative space itself has a concrete presence which makes it capable to narrate itself, but at the same time to be a mirror value of the material aspects. So following Moretti, um, he comes up with four qualities of space that are appearing. He talks about geometric form, volume, density, and energetic pressure. In the picture left, you see the negative space of Guarino Guarini's Church of Santa Maria della Divina Providenza in Lisboa. And there he describes, for example, the extreme modulation of the internal volumes into one single continuous body. So each point of the space is connected to the other one or in other words, if one cupola falls, the whole building is devastated. On the right side, he compares it with Palladio's Villa La Rotunda. There, Moretti describes a lyrical catenation of sharply distinguished units. And I think by combination of the two examples, the point he wants to make gets very obvious. The next foil, please. Teaching gave a very ideal platform to make inverse space studies of some selected residential buildings of the 20th century. We did that with students at different schools. Houses were chosen where the internal spatial sequences pursue more rather than less distinct outlines and appear of structures of varying complexity of the outside. The more dissolved the spatial conception is, the less effective the hollow space models are as meaningful forms of analysis. Next foil. Inspired by the force of the hollow space casts of inner spaces, we went on to analyze facades in a similar way. The varying degrees of plasticity from high to flat relief can be nicely visualized by doing casts where the depth from the outermost point of each surface represented in reality a one meter thick slice of encompassing space. Encompassing space is umraum in German. I don't know how to translate it better. By the double-sided wall figure, you get a very good idea of the spatial effects of the plastic values. 
The example here shows the rear facade of Giuseppe Terrani's Casa del Fascio, where the grid is only slightly legible in a pronounced accentuation of the slightly asymmetrical center, which indicates the patio behind it. The mirror value reflects the degree of interlocking between inside and outside, which can be in a more fine spatial or in a more plastic category. Next. So in the book, we had one headline called block and interlocking. But um, it was not only one of the most important chapters in the book, but for me always has been one of the main design issues. It turns about around the topic that the facade development itself interlocks in different ways with the existing built and landscape orders, while at the same time, constantly the primacy of the block being kept is one of the most fascinating design themes. Next. I often get asked about the block's fascination. And my answer to that points out that the block is the greatest possible contrast to nature's organic forms. Mankind distinguished itself as a cultural entity a long time ago with the extraction of its habitation from nature's flow of forms. The contrasting principle of culture and nature of architecture understood as a spatial art that is juxtaposed to the endless space and the human bodies as an abstract system, it is that idea that has not been surpassed in its clarity to this day. Next. The concept of the architectural block or block-like always implies space retentive bodies and always the bodies consist of individual building elements. So it has nothing to do with uh, so-called monoliths or something like that, or sculptures. When operating with a high degree of abstraction of a block-like building, the considerations relating to the creation of tension, corporality, and the possible connections to the encompassing spaces are crucial to the effect. Next, trying to explain corporality. It has nothing to do with anthropomorphic sympathy, nor with a world of soft, continuous transitions. In an architectural sense, corporality means that the building is graspable to the eye and that its mass develops sufficient force to visually resist the forces that act upon it from outside. So therefore the balance between the expansive forces from inside and the compressive forces from outside ensures that the gestalt of a building can develop corporality, körperlichkeit, or tenseness or elasticity. These again are all generic properties that we know from the body and that brings us back to Wolflin, what I tried to explain at the beginning. So to achieve corporality within a wooden building is even more difficult. I'll get back to that later. The two pictures here show the kindergarten nursery in Ara that under cost, cost pressure has been cut back. And it shows the effort to come up with new elements that compensate the proportional transformations. Next. Another crucial point of the concept of the architectural block is based on the idea of a rational reduction of horizontality and verticality. And again, we are with the human body. The two principal directions of our bodies and our environment are horizontality and verticality. Conditioned by gravity, physical space is experienced by man as asymmetrical. This produces the need to relate the two dimensions with each other, to catenate them together. I use therefore the adjectives wedging, clamping, hitching, mortising. In German, verklammung, verzahnung. 
Next, in the course of cost cuts, the customer decided to cut down the room height, along the way deleting the original typology with the light from two sides through an overhead ribbon window. As a reaction, small skylights were precisely inscribed into the ceiling fields, but at the same time were optically tuned. Like a pair of eyes that are rouged, the skylights become visually enlarged and lift the view to the ceiling, which helps to compensate the lost section figure. The acoustic ceiling cap resembles a tatami floor that has been flipped to the ceiling. All taken measures are in service to connect ceiling, floor, and walls, interwave them, and earthen the space. Next. The subjective impression of the height of the sky ceiling, yes, the sky ceiling has a height, depends of the buildings, of their correlations, of their heights, their distances to each other, and the profile of their silhouettes. If you have a closed square that shows buildings all of the same height, the sky ceiling will appear lower than if one building rears up. Also, ein, wenn ein Gebäude sich aufbäumt. The highest point of the Suttel House in Schkul, uh, there was a small conversion from a stable into a living house, is set against the slope of the hill. The new head volume rears itself slightly up towards the valley and the sun. It is vertically interlocking with the sky. And when we were designing this small house, immediately the very strong blocks of Roman churches in Western France came up. Set against the slope of the terrain, the buildings pressed themselves up vertically with rearing, rearing gestures. They show building masses that are staggered and emerge from the success successive addition of interior spatial elements with direct external appearance. Next. So these two topics very much describe the concept of the volumetry of the cantonal school in Urdorf competition project. A successive addition of interior spatial elements with more and less direct external appearance and masses that find space fine spatially interview, interweave with the sky ceiling. Next. Of course, the topic fits also very well on one of the few houses I was able to build so far. I titled the two pictures, vertical interlocking and horizontal projections. I think the points are obvious so that I will just add a short summary of the first category. What is on my mind is the feeling of the need to bring back the focus to look at the effect of architecture. The architectural attention has to go to how space or spatial forms appear, what kind of effect they have on a human being. And only by understanding basic principles, a conscious space creating is possible and that every architect should be able to do. Coming to the next category. The so-called culture of transformation. So architecture, I understand as a collection of elements of architectural instruments that along the times reappear and that are always slightly changed. Design processes in that sense are transformation processes in which material of the past consciously and gradually is remodeled into the present. Such a culture of transformation is based on memory and cultural history, while at the same time actively takes aim for renewal. So continuity and change are entangled very closely. Next, please. I'll try to give an impression of how I see the transformation term by making a few points concerning how Palladio's design approach in general and his villa Malcontenta in particular inspired me when I was designing the apartment house La Contenta. 
It is probably unnecessary to point out Palladio's use of the antique principle of very clear, simple shaped structures, very plain, again, block-like buildings. He is a master in letting them appear very appointed and clear, give them visual solidity, dignity, generosity, superiorness, all qualities I like to track. Palladio is a master of clever moderation of different elements of articulating measures that lead to visually balanced architectural bodies, which complex inner order is being wheeled at first sight. And very important, Palladio's villas are contextual. They react always with facades, which in dependence to their site and specific context are treated radically different. One exception is the rotunda that we saw before. The hierarchization of the La Contente facades is realized with two representative shields to the street and park site. In these shields, the openings are overbalancing the closed walls. Next. The Malcontente gets a vertical shoot, ein Höhentrieb, by the porticus columns. In the Contente, horizontal and vertical elements are interweaved to a grid. To push the vertical shoot of the stocky volume, unfortunately, I was not able to build it one um, etage higher. So to push the stocky volume, the horizontal elements are played down while the vertical parts pull upwards like pilaster strips, lisein. In the big openings on a second plasticity layer, panels of lined bricks are filled in. They diminish the degree of opening and establish a second vertical articulation layer. With their merciless dimensions of 24 by 24 by three centimeters, they act like a determining modular for the whole house and relate the floors one to the other. They also appear always there where the human being gets in tactile contact with the house. Next. Palladio is very virtuosic what concerns the linking spaces between inside and outside. In his work, you find a lot of different types of relations between porticus and block of the house. For example, in the Malcontente, it steps completely forward outside of the block. But in other houses, let's say Villa Emo, the porticus is let in flush with the outside of the facade. Or in the Villa Tiene, also let in flush, it stretches over the whole facade. So Palado shows a very intensive examination of the topic how to deal with columns and walls. Following Goethe, this is an eternal conflict that Palladio is mastering. The virtuosity and the amalgamation of wall and column architecture particularly also shows in the section, the fusion of the gable and the frame above the columns in a brick architecture. Yes, it's all in brick, Palladio's um, gable, is a constructively very de delicate detail. So next. In the La Contente, the linking spaces are articulated as let in lodges into the block. To the street, they are let in flush, while to the park side, their floor plates with expressive spouters jut out into the green space. The corner lodges show pow powerful columns, which are dimensioned towards visual solidity. The edges of the floor plates are thickened, and together with the freestanding columns and the wall columns, they form a subtle framing. They kind of constrict slightly the lodger space in the transition to the encompassing space. In combination with the sloped roof, there arise a considerable variety of transition spaces, which requires a diversified vocabulary to join horizontal and vertical elements. Next. The organization of the floor plans is a crucial feature for Palladio's villas and palaces. A system of hollow spaces linked by small passages, 
is established out of, re of rectangles of different sizes with often same or similar proportions. This opens up the possibility of different sections for the cells, which strengthens autonomy and identity of each hollow space. In Palladio's floor plans, just like in his facades, you sense the ambition of complete clearness and ideal arrangement of the units, the permanent struggle for harmonic relations. It is therefore less the scheme or its formalizing, not symmetry or cruciform that interests me, but rather the art how through tireless grouping and regrouping, he achieves to cast a variety of cells into a unity that not only on the plan, but also in reality is sensed to be a well-balanced space. This aim came along with the floor plan design of the La Contente. Like in the Palladian hallway free systems, rather square rectangles get composed to each other. These cells are experienced as separate units, albeit visually braced with the next room through lateral wide sliding door openings. Again, it is the bargain between silence, dynamic, openness, closeness, degree of isolation or entanglement. The relations get also slightly modified from floor to floor. In the duplex apartments of the top two floors, the degree of openness increases. Space appears more flowing. The space figures emancipate and get less explicit. Next, please. At the latest in the top floors, it becomes clear that the rotating movement of the crest of spaces around the staircase is juxtaposed by another layer, deriving from a static constructive logic. The Schotten system, the slab system, that flashes through only little in the lower floor plans, in the top plan, stamps the space impression more. Even though some of the slabs, as a tapering structure, as a sich verjüngende Konstruktion, get reduced to be very, very thin roof beams and reach the constructive border. The slab system shapes the section figures. The atmosphere of the space oscillates between plan libre and plan paralysé. They generate the inner structure out of which the roof shape and the rhythm of the facade shields are developed. Next, please. I want to make one more example to show how the degree of transformation can change within your own work. At the beginning of a design career, the tracks of the things you have looked at and you are inspired by will be mirrored more direct or at least different than after a while. So when we had finished the Biene House in 2006, we sent an invitation card with the low house by Mac Kim, Mead and White for the viewing. It was supposed to stand for the affine, the familiar and different at the same time. Aspects we felt are found in the Biene House too. The low house, is one of the houses of the American summer, is also called the small big house because it is demonstrating an iconoclastical break. While in his dimensions, it is very big and was supposed to be representative and somehow mannered. It was built in the poor construction material timber frame that so far was connected more to trivial and peripheral buildings like barns coming out of a vernacular architecture. So the oscillation between vernacular and thought architecture produced a very fascinating appearance, an appearance of something very familiar and bulky at the same time. The Gestalt of the Biene House is defined by its long rectangular block, which is set at right angles with the hillside and is interlocked with the sky by its sloped roof. Next slide, please. On the material level, the Biene House superficially tries to establish familiarity to the surrounding houses by using the for the Canton Thurgau, this area it stands in, contextual shingles that makes the design local. 
on a universal level, the design themes pivot around the following points. A big question was about how many, how big openings a wall can bear so as to rest optically stable. A topic that, for example, Mies van der Rohe had widely pushed with his Krefeld houses that you might know or you know. The other concern was on how a house that claims to be representative would be able to evoke the idea of solidity by using wood and shingles. And this lesson was greatly, I think we greatly, or you can greatly learn by the houses of the American summer. So McKim, Mead and White were masters in modeling the shingle dress in a way that the different luminosities, the light shadow effects of the very labor intensive shingles would be accentuated. Here, the role model for the Biene House is very evident. The Biene House is visually stabilized in its horizontal and vertical transition areas by the swinging convex concave facade. Even though the shingle skin being very thin, plasticity can be developed by these instruments. And again, the structure appears as set under, under inner tension. Next picture. The shown pictures are just a parenthesis remark. It is very apparent that the 15 years later built kindergarten and nursery is still nourished by the same desires, but the themes are interpreted slightly differently. Next. Plasticity is also being pushed by equipping linear elements with plain values. The gigantic slab columns of the ground floor follow this idea. As in the La Contente, the dimensions and shape is not deriving from static calculation at all, but are dimensioned only visually. The next. The approach of the Biene House might appear analogous at first sight, but it is not. On a constructive layer, it is perfectly embedded in its time, not, not in nowadays time, but uh, 15 years ago, and tried to go new ways. The so-called traditional Abwürfe that evoke the image of eyebrows are con constructively loaded. The idea is to keep the window set flush in the wall, to keep the tension and avoid the visual breaking of the block because of the very fragile re relationship between wall and openings and still be able to have an integrated outside sunscreen. This is achieved by the trick to shift each floor slightly to the outside. It's kind of like a reversal of a Christmas tree. So these shifted eyebrows become indications of the development of the house on the hillside and the timber frame construction system. Beyond that, optical stability is provided. And again, an interlocking of the structure with the encompassing space on a fine spatial niveau. Next picture, please. The floor plan of the house develops out of very few big room cells which by the exception of bathroom and sleeping rooms span from house side to house side, each occupying two corners so that the rooms get light from three sides. Again, the transitions, tra transitions between inside and outside the building are focused and different versions appear. The windows are low cut and have deep soffits for sitting. The deeply inversed loggia and the entrance are sheltered places where the encompassing space invades the house. Like in the shingle style houses of McKim, Mead and White, the place and type of staircase defines the spatial development of the house. Next slide, please. The staircase is a real space of circulation, a real staircase which through the generosity of its stairs, by its central position, by its connection to the entrance hall and the loggia, and by its end space as a gallery underneath the roof is a decisive moment of the house. 
The next. The dark staircase tower, like a solid pillar, gives hold to the entity of the space structure with their big cells and the ambivalent thin shingle facade. It brings solidity. And again, it shows another level also the interlocking moments with the other rooms. So the final remark on the term culture of transformation, themes can be tuned over and over again, not only from history to your own projects, but also from one project to another. Uh, Adolf Krishnitz once called it, Architektur is the Unterschied zwischen Architektur. Architecture is the difference of architecture. Hermann Czech called it, alles ist Umbau, everything is conversion. And I think these are two sentences that are uh, very strong standing for what I believe in as a culture of transformation. So nothing comes out of nothing. Everything can be tuned and you don't need to be stubborn to work on the same subjects your whole life. Okay, let's go on to the third category, structure and space. So one of the main focus of my practical and also theoretical work is the interplay between space and construction as shown a few pictures before. The hierarch hierarchical order is clear. Construction follows the spatial idea and tries to heighten it. Structure and construction is a potent medium for expression. Technology and technique should be used to achieve spatial intentions. Construction and structural thinking, therefore, will always be a base or a grammar, you can call it, that we should learn and master. For certain typologies, design can be understood as a bargaining process between space and construction. Next. Nowadays, it has become very complex and it is not possible to do that by your own, which means that the cooperation between engineer and architect becomes very important. Since many years, I am concerned with different kinds of productive corporations between engineer and architect, tracking the potential of the so-called constructors dialogue. So um, as was mentioned in the introduction, I did a couple books about it and also exhibitions. With a couple of own projects, I will try to crystallize the bargaining process between space and structure. It shows that it's not a question of size if the dialogue between engineer and architect gets fruitful, but rather a question of curiosity to heighten each other's concerns by understanding the other's tasks and by speaking a bit the language of the other one. Next. The design for the bathing house in Bad Ragaz was developed with Jürg Konzett. You might know him. He's a famous uh, Swiss engineer who is also a bridge builder. In Bad Ragaz, directly next to the Hotel Tamina, the task was to replace an old employee's home with a new bathing house on an existing footprint, integrating the existing lane to the basement parking. Next. The central idea of the spatial sequences was the arrangement of the bathing world in the top floor. Like that, people coming from the underground passage from the hotel would climb up to the bath and relaxation room. Next. The floor plans always prejudge the possibility in the sections, as I talked about before in La Contenta. Here, we worked with a butterfly figure that was evolved out of the outline geometry of the existing building, and at the same time would give us the desired premises for our section. Concerning the bathing room from the beginning, the desire was a structure that could center so that the space would become grounded and silent. We started with the image of cupolas until Jörg came up with the idea of the diagrid system. 
that met our elementary spatial desires perfectly in a more translated, more engineered way in a more contemporary technique. Next. The bathing room on the top floor through its three-sided closing with massive walls shows enough privacy and intimacy and silence to be opened up completely on the fourth, the length side to the outside space. The side from the bathing room gets caught in the trees, tree crowns of the hotel park. The space is diaphanous lighted through the ceiling that is made out of concrete prefab elements with inlaid glass bricks that lie on the primary structure. That disarms an unpleasing backlight situation and helps to balance the light in general. So these measures are in charge that the room is spatially contained and at the same time highly connected with the outside space. The generous and openable window fronts are made possible by a star shaped a diagrid ceiling structure that is able to span the length side of the space without supports. The structure in the bathing house is oversized. We heightened the beer dimensions so that the airing system could be integrated. So by looking at the structural principle, all these atmosphere ideas are not present. The AXO scheme much more visualizes the potential of the diagrid principle as an engineering structure. Jürg liked it very much for that ba basing room geometry because by being reduced to two star elements, its crossing system got compelling and could perfectly achieve the support free structure of the length side. He would always say, finally, a diagrid system that makes sense. Next pictures, please. So this is one of the designs for another example, again with Jürg, that has been crucially marked by structural ideas. It is about an extension to a rectangular jog trot, an trotte, where wine is uh, being made with a strong silhouetted gable roof sitting parallelly to the hillside in the middle of the vineyards. The cultural heritage preservations wish to keep the genuine setting the appearance of that solitaire we could easily follow and therefore respected it. The next slides. The design for the extension reacts with a directly attached structure to the existing, reaching underneath the slope on the uphill side. A mass that has about the same volume like the old building, though other proportions, is being taken out of the hillside and becomes a sunken counterbalance and Gegengewicht to the existing structure. So the new cellar house is covered with earth and the dimensions of the underground structure from outside will be presumable only by the protuberance of the roof light at the north end and the appearing new entrance zone to the west. These from earth protuberated sculptures defined together with the old jog trot, the space of a meadow. The rest of the landscape rests untouched and is defined by the wines that softly embed the jog trot. Next. So after these basic preconditions, we were driven by the question, what kind of spatial topics could be relevant to make a subterranean space of that dimension and within the special conditions of the rising hillside to be a pleasant space. It was Jürg again who brought the reference of the gym in Nervis Stadio Flaminio in Rome. The reference seemed to have quite similarity, nearness with the situation of our section and the ideas about lightning. The geometry of the rejuvenating concrete frames in Nervis Nervis project came out of the sloped tribunes of the stadio, but seemed to be a perfect way to master statically and visually the subject of the pressure of the hillside and the asymmetrical section in general. Next. So Nervis structural idea helped us to develop the spatial topics of the cellar building. 
into a fortified excavation, we put a one-hipped concrete frame structure, which stands at right angle to the slope and absorbs the pressure of the slope physically and visually. It gives answers to the question of dealing with an ascending room height and clever integration of the natural lighting elements of the cellar space. Next. The other main point detached from Nervi was the quality of the cavern itself, the crudity of the fracture points of the spoil, the interface of the new built space and the soil should rest sensible in the finished building. The hollow space of the cut out mass is therefore being fortified with a retaining wall of rammed earth. The layers, the colors and the archaic directness our image of the soil of which grow out the vines. At the end, it is the combination of the reflection of the glass bottle bottom like glass bricks with the sharp edged concrete frames and the absorbing earthen walls with truss mortar, truss cut, and the rammed earth floor that determines the spatial quality. All the measures together lead to an oscillating space between a sacral and industrial and an archaic atmosphere. And the event room gets, despite its underground position, to a raised space. Next. There are further implications lying in the chosen relationship between structure and infilling parts, where engineer and architect opinion were not all over congruent, but I'm not commenting on that further. But to give an idea on how different the main points are verbalized by the architect and the engineer, I want to close the project with an extract of the dry statical description of the engineer. So slope pressure is taken by an adobe wall W. The sloped form that is the inclination to the vertical reduces the earth support. On the one hand, the rammed earth wall introduces the earth pressure directly to the floor plate B. On the other hand, also in the frame helps C, S, and into the skylight wall O. The frame helps S are based on the frame bars R. The latter are held in their position by the roof plate D, which acts like a reclined barrier between the outer walls M. So I think that gives a good impression about the different languages that engineer and architect have to be able to talk together in. And I'm gonna do a short last example with the next um, pictures. Within the work on the books and exhibitions around constructors dialogue and in the li lively mentoral exchange with Jürg, I learned also a lot about fascinating structural systems for wide spans. The system that had left marks in my mind was the so-called Schwedler cupola, a three-dimensionally carrying shell structure invented by Johann Wilhelm Schwedler in the 1860s. So his achievement was basically to bring a highly undefined statical space framework into a calculable static model by joining the bar structure into a rotation symmetric membrane shell that was describable with conditions of equilibrium. This new type of construction for a cupola and steel was applied, for example, for the roofing of big round gasometer buildings in Berlin spanning up to 45 meters. So when the competition for a new planetarium in Lausanne was announced, it was clear that this would be an ideal possibility to interpret such a cupola system with a known design. The special use of the complex Porte des Etoiles had to be mended into an existing hamlet with rural architecture. At the same time, it was the wish to use the, the iconographic shape connotation of the planetarium as an appearing advertising moment for the whole complex. The planetarium therefore we placed on the top floor with its cupola set into the square floor plan in a way that its silhouette would appear from the street but also from the courtyard 
at the same time respecting the surrounding gable room roof geometries. Next. The outer roof of the planetarium that appears in silhouette shows dimensions that stem from an urbanistic idea and consist of such a Schwedler cupola construction. Their meridians and circle parallels are in blue laminated timber, which together with the diagonals and steel form a very stiff spatial framework that is covered with sheet. The lightweight construction is rested on the top slab. The rest of the structure is in concrete with ripped slabs for the lower floors to take the wide spans. And the last picture. The geometry of the cupola determines the exhibition spaces in the below floors. The structure consists there of a radially shaped concrete ribs crest, a bar shaped structure that refers to the contextual wooden structures, but for fire safety reasons is realized in concrete. So the radiating structure is supported by the outside walls and one middle pillar. Within the established rib order, the exhibition spaces are freely dividable. Okay, I'm coming to the last category and I'm trying to keep it short, seeing the time running. It's called urbanism and architecture or architecture and urbanism. I am convinced that urbanism, structure, proportion, and material in a design process are interpenetrating categories and are to be discussed parallelly. Nevertheless, you have to take hierarchical decisions within a design process, starting with basic questions about the relation of figure and ground, solids and voids. The next slides. The plants, you know, probably they show two extremes as basic elements of space building. The modernistic peripheric spatial concept that is following heliothermic fundamentals and the texture of the traditional city. The modernistic space comprehension emanates from isolated objects on free ground. The plan is foremost white, an undefined white ground that supports the objects. It shows accumulation of mass in an untouched emptiness. We call it figure ground, figure ground. The traditional city on the right side shows an almost black plan. We identify an accumulation of white voids in a structureless mass. The historic mass is forming the blanks, which appear itself as a figure or even more like a figure than the mass body itself. We talk about figure figure. So the questions about how much openness and how much closeness a development should show has been and still is a constant in architectural debate. Next. My personal crucial experiences are the spaces Fernand Pouillon created in his housing projects that he realized in the 50s in France and in Algiers. The lots he worked on were quite big, often in a heterogeneous surrounding, former areas of mixed use, industry and housing. Pouillon developed a new typology, which he calls Ensemble Monumental Urbain. So, monumental urban ensemble, and in which he tries to develop an own introverted identity with a semi-public accommodation character and quartier character and clearly readable inner space figures. The emus, the so-called emus, they are urban compositions related to their inner landscapes that consist of a progression of space sequences consisting out of courts, squares, promenades, walkways, etc. So Pouillon is very close to the 19th century ideals. He, for example, refers to place de Vos, Place de Vos or Place Dauphine, but clearly he's not building an analogous city. So in contrast to classical perimeter block development, which is completely closed and leveled on one height, he operates with differentiated penetrability and varied block heights that interlock with the sky ceiling. We're back there. 
The buildings thereby react towards their context. They mark specific situations and are broken very awarely to connect and relate the inside with the outside encompassing space. It is also remarkable that he draws back the buildings from the street and creates a kind of Furtzone with auxiliary structures that conciliate to the lower context. Next. With his compositions, Bouillon achieves a manifold inner landscape that lives of the diversity of their elements and the in-between established perspectives. Depending on where the housing settlement is entered, the sequence varies. In his Algier project, for example, the circle-like movement is more pushed than in the French settlements. The quality of the inner landscape is based on a targeted implementation of nearness, vastness, and vis-a-vis -vis relations, and generally by creating an atmosphere of stay and of pedestrians. The cars are kept outside. Next. In this example, the entrance into the settlement occurs through low structures as an incipient gesture. The high slab-like block shows how the facades are, are directed and hierarchized. And it is a nice example for how special situations are visibly marked, the entrance, and equipped by special elements, two columns. There are manifold possibilities to do that. Next, all facades superficially are structured within classical order principles. They show base, main part, and attic, but undergo modernistic transformations. For example, the eight-story high slab shows a three-story high attic with a dense fenestration. So he's using diverse general types, which he varies within their meaning. The bay, his ordinances, his measurement and repetition, and represents the load-bearing system and the contour of the emu. Finally, it is the material of the natural stone that connects all the orders to a unity. This material unity draws through his complete work. Next. For some of the Algier settlements, he even imports the natural stones from France. The houses are the stony background for the collective activities. They are mu mural qualities, the presence of the material, and the wise application of ornaments on a fine spatial level define the atmosphere of the outside spaces. So especially in housing design, I think it is very important to understand that the collective is the fundament of a functioning society and that only strong public spaces can strengthen this space. Biggest attention is to be paid to the urban open space that is constituted by the housing. I want to close with Bouillon's statements that the ensemble is always more important than every isolated masterpiece and that designing big scale settlements, the questions about the relation to the human being measure on one side and the relation of the settlement to the city on the other side are the topics to give answers to. And the last two pictures. So concluding, I would like to say that urbanism, structure, proportion and material in a design process therefore are interpenetrating categories and have to be discussed parallelly. Only an integral but at the same time hierarchic thinking can lead to space of all scales that show sense for effect, dimensions, shape and usage, and therefore are architecturally, physically suitable for human beings. And that's what I think architecture should turn around. Thank you. Took a bit long, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hope nobody's asleep. <laughs> Thank you uh, very much, uh, Aita, for a truly uh, inspiring lecture. That is, uh, I believe, a very precise contribution to um, not least our institute's ongoing focus on uh, analysis in architecture. 
uh, but I should not go uh, too far down this lane because we have, as mentioned earlier, invited um, Professor uh, Nikolai Bo Andersen from our faculty um, to join this discussion with, uh, with questions uh, and to open some topics. Um, I would also like to just again mention uh, for uh, th those of you uh, listening to this that you can uh, contribute to this discussion through the chat. Ida Flarup will uh, follow the chat and uh, ask uh, questions for the um, for the discussion here. Mm -hmm. So welcome Nikolai uh, Bo Andersen. Yeah, Nikolai is uh, heading the program of uh, cultural heritage transformation and restoration uh, at the Institute of Architecture and Culture and uh, very relevant also known uh, or well traveled in uh, in Switzerland and uh, <laughs> uh, has been guest professor in München and uh, around. Welcome Nikolai. Thank you very much and thank you Aita for a very inspiring lecture. Um, I um, it, it was very interesting for me to see because uh, I think you work with a lot of themes that I personally uh, am very interested in and and I think that that your practice can truly be described as a reflective practice as Morton mentioned in the in the in his introduction I think it was truly refreshing to see uh, your work in a world in a contemporary reality where it seems to me that a lot is being built, but without much thought, to be honest. So as I understand your work, it is some uh, an, an architectural practice that in a way are interested in thinking the world, thinking the human existence in, in the world, um, and um, and I think that's uh, well to me <laughs> is 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 really inspiring to see. Um, before getting to my, uh, I will try to 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 ask a question. But but before I do that, I will just give a sh short reflection on. You were talking about the corporality or the importance of the embodied qualities of architecture. And you didn't mention it, but uh, it seems to me that what you were actually talking about is uh, phenomenology, uh, uh, an issue that, uh, again, I'm personally very interested in, um, the importance of embodied sensations and, and, mm. and the effects of architecture on human beings. Uh, the importance and 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 that I think, as I understood it, that that perspective uh, were actually part of all your uh, you call it chapters in in your lecture. The uh, both the architecture of space, the culture of transformation, structure and space, and the architecture and urbanism section. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so that was maybe just some kind of, um, yeah, maybe that, that could be my first question. Is that, is that correct? Uh, if I understand the way you approach it as a phenomeno phenomenological approach, uh, is that something that interests you at all? Or is it just uh, a coincidence? No, no, I, I think you're completely right. For me, it just does not matter whether things appear the way they do, or I sense them. So it's depending on who you read. Mm -hmm. Like uh, Arnheim is maybe more on the phenomenological side. Things appear, but um, Wölflin, you sense them. So it's a question, who is the subject and, who, and what is the object? But mm -hmm. at the end, the result is the same. I think that we can sense space through our body and yeah the rest doesn't matter <laughs> <laughs> basically yeah. but, that but this be... is a very important um, thing and I think it got lost a bit in the last years mm -hmm. and also the the idea that everybody can send space it's just the point that the architect has to know what kind of of 
measures he has to, to build space with a certain effect. I would say a lot of architects don't really know what they are doing in terms of space effect. And this is maybe a bit the manco also of schools. I think, or at least I, I missed it myself at school because I always had like feelings about space, but nobody could really talk about it, you know, take the terms, uh, what, what is it about? And I think that was one of the big wishes why I wanted to do that book with Roger, to try to find out how can we talk about it? And then passing by Moretti and all these people who try to do that. Um, yeah, you get a vocabulary. And uh, sometimes people say, yeah, but you always say you talk about space, but you don't really talk about space. And I have to say, yeah, but that's what it is. What I think it is, all these different aspects of space taken together. It's, it's not... Um, an abstract thing, but it's a complex, um, yeah, there are different things that combine our being space at the end and that we sense. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, and maybe you could uh, elaborate a little bit about that because you were talking about, um, when you were talking about the effect on the human being of some kind of a, 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 an inside pressure and an outside pressure to the building. Um, you're also talking about the importance of structure, proportion, materiality. Um, I could add maybe material consistency, thermal conductivity, textual effects, gravity, mm -hmm. things like that, that uh, affects the human body and, and brings mm -hmm. us in a, in, a, in a, basically in an emotional state. Um, but but what, could, could you maybe elaborate a little bit on what, what parameters do you think are the most important uh, in trying to, to, to create this, this, this effect, uh, architectural mm -hmm. effect? Yeah, maybe um, if you have the book, uh, Primer to Space, you, you check the chapters <laughs> and they will try to, to focus on different things. Like one is block and interlocking. We have sequences and profiles. We have ornament and material. We have typology and topography. So I wouldn't say there is a hierarchy, but all of them are are important at different points of time of a design, maybe. And to have the references of, of built architecture, for me, is very useful to check uh, yeah, how, it, how that works. Mm -hmm. So you can try, uh, you can read Arnheim also. It might not be the very um, actual, uh, examples that are in there but doesn't really matter but this could be another project to take nowadays examples and describe them in a way like Arnheim did and then with that um, you can go out and look at everything and you get the ideas on, on what you can look that's what I try to to talk about at La Contente how verticality and horizontal things come together because I felt the volume as being too low but I couldn't change it because of building laws. But how can you like change the effect? So that's that's basically what my work is is turning around. Or with the cutting downs in Arau that were really they changed the complete profile of the building because they cut down the main spaces, and I had to come up with new ideas on how to give height to the building how to raise them and so it depends on on the status of the project what kind of, of things but of, of course i mean maybe the other thing is that there are architects they only speak about material basically and i always say um well the material is is not guilty and but it's also not everything i mean material is part of the thing of course, the shingle facade everybody likes, 
but you can do it differently. You know, you can still fail also with a shingle facade. <laughs> That's what I think. So, yeah. Yeah, and then and that that could bring me to my next uh, question that would have something to do about uh, yeah the question of of transformation and um, and 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 how do how you understand that because you talk about it as this question of continuity and change mm -hmm. and uh, and you refer to also one of my favorites uh, Hermann Schech who who says alles ist umbau everything mm -hmm. is building conversion, uh, conversion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when we talk about transformation here in Copenhagen normally often we would think that it is a uh, reuse or remodeling of an existing building but but when you talk about transformation you talk with of it more as a yeah and it's not not necessarily a historical context or and it's not a stylistic feature, yeah. but rather it is some kind of the material of history that is mm -hmm. being transformed uh, mm -hmm. and remodeled um, and so, so could you? Would it be fair to say that that when you the, when you use the word transformation or culture of transformation, that it is in a, a way a transformation of ideas? Uh, is it? Would you agree that, or would, do you think that uh, transformation is, or what you do, is actually always a temporal answer to an? eternal question is there an architecture some questions that oh. go uh, all across uh, every every period in history yeah well i i think i take out themes themes that's what i take out of historical um, references and it's very easy it's um by doing some research if for example with that constructors dialogue, you pass along structures. Or I once had a lecture about Palladio, so this was the beginning of, you know, learning of Palladio, and it's also a bit coincidentally, but of course also led, of course, by by things that you know, read, whatever. But then you start to find out what you like and you don't like, and of course I look at the examples I like and try to find out um, what can I use out of that? What themes are there? And of course, it's a, a momentary um, thing or architecture that I'm doing, but the aim is timelessness. I mean, it's a very big aim. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you look at the buildings, you will always be able to put them into a period of time. It's not possible, but that they get so strong and so powerful that they rest timeless with timelessness, do you say that? Mm -hmm. um, valid. Mm -hmm. So that's the big aim. I mean, I, I know um, that a lot of people don't think that way. So they, mm -hmm. it's, it's architecture should be more something peripheral or um, just contemporary and uh, changing and everything and I, I'm not against changing but I think you have to have a first state that is really powerful at least mm -hmm. so um yeah and that's what I'm interested in that's why I come with Palladio and all the, the generic um uh eigenschaft and that he has and what mm -hmm. he's looking for and I try to I mean I had to build a uh, content uh, with a uh, styropo it's a uh, with what? what also you... with uh, outside insulation. It, it's okay. not uh, made out of marble or something, not at all. It's just trying to keep an impression how you could yeah, have some of the effects transformed into a nowadays problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, but I think it's, it's necessary to be um, on a longer perspective. So for me, yeah, of course, if you can build in, in real nice materials, that's even nicer, but not all of us are able to. So at least you should build so strong structures and 
spaces that they are valid for a certain time. And these kind of structures I look at to take my references from to find out how to transform out of them. So. Can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah. We, yeah. Also, we also have a question from Nini, but we'll take you, Morden, first, and then uh, Nini Lyman also have a question afterwards. Okay, cool. It's because it's a very, I think it's a very practical one, uh, uh, according to how you do this. Uh, I mean, I really enjoyed your uh, your descri description of the house bean, where the the openings should be as large as the facade could bear. Uh, is if I remember correctly, that was uh... yeah. And as a as long as the wall is still a wall and not falling apart. Yeah, exactly. I really yeah. enjoyed that description because I, I, I maybe somebody from the chat can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I think that Elva Elto wow. in his experimental house um, summer house, he uh, discussed the um, the opening in the courtyard in the same way. Uh, no. Okay. Uh, he, somebody asked him how how large they should build it, and he said uh, so large that the space does not fall out. Okay. So quite a similar uh, yeah. quote from up there. But I would like to well, ask. Well, I, I didn't come up with it by myself. It was like Mies van der Rohe and his play felt houses <laughs> who tried to find out how how big can these openings be that in a brick wall the wall is still optically stable. Okay. So, so, uh, but maybe Alto, Alto had the same idea, probably. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just I'd like to ask you, how do you, when you work, study uh, this kind of a question? I mean, very practically, do you do you draw it or do you build it in model or how do you how do you mm. work with it very practically? Uh, we used to build a lot of models. And that's for sure the best way, I think, to look at it and check it but I think also once you get a bit older maybe you have a bit more experience you can build a little less models and just you know check it also by even 2d drawings I think it's possible mm. but um, yeah if you have a model it's always the best and and it's a uh, I mean, I never write the text before I build the house. That's the key. So the text I write afterwards, hmm. trying to capture all the ideas that uh, intuitionally, I would say, or with the big backpack that you have by the years, came together and you were thinking about. But I would never start to write the text first. And then also, I'm not Wittgenstein who writes the house or something hmm. so um but i think the models are a very important medium especially i mean the the ones that you let your students build also very were very nice and a very powerful thing to find out about space are these negative models um where you get the feeling of the void space i think and maybe for the facade, I showed this example of Terrani. It's, it's, I would never build a model like this for an own design, but for students to see how, how plasticity works, this is a very nice instrument, I think. So I think, but, uh, I think yeah. maybe, oh, sorry, Aita. Um. I just, uh, the bottom line would be, I think the media changes over the time a bit also. Depends also on resources you have and also on the, on the experience that you have. I think maybe on that note as well, I, could, I would like to pose a question uh, for you that has come from uh, Nini Lyman, who's also a professor here at uh, the Royal Academy yep. and uh, who, uh, who heads a program at uh, the Institute of Architecture and Technology. And uh, Nini has, uh, has asked, he said, um, Aita mentioned it was difficult to achieve corporality in wooden buildings. Please elaborate on that. <laughs> yeah. um, I think that's, yeah, I also wrote that down. That's yeah. interesting there between practicality and then, the, yeah. you know. Um, yeah, well, wood is a linear material. I mean, you don't have like, uh, um, wood, wood things are like thin things, linear ones. And if you don't join them well, 
I would say that does not look massive because it is not massive. It's not like a stone building or a brick. It has never that thickness. So you have to come up in my eyes with other measures um, to make a living house look more solid. I mean, at least if you want to have a look like a barn, then you don't have to do it. But this was the thing about these uh, American summer houses that I liked, that they tried to, with some tricks or some joint, um, the way they join the things, they get more representativeness. It, it looks more, it looks richer, it looks not like a barn. And mm. I mean, that's why wood first came from trivial, peripheral buildings was used more to like that. I mean, we had this um, customer actually, he said, ah, you want to do a wood building, but it, it's called Steinreich as a stone rich. I don't know if you say that in Danish too, but if you want to say it, somebody's really rich, you say it's he's stone rich <laughs> and not wood rich. <laughs> so how can you make something representative out of wood? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of buildings nowadays that are maybe under the premise, oh, it's ecological, it's, you know, wood as the material of our time, and the rest is forgotten. So that's why I emphasize in that. Of course, it's a good material to build with in the point of uh, sust sustainability. I didn't even take the word into my mouth today. Maybe you noticed. <laughs> but maybe another parenthesis remark. I think sustainability is, has to do with something that rests for a long time and rests beautiful and powerful for a long time also. I mean, the rest, we know what you should do and not and where you get your energy from and all that. So... Therefore, wood and the idea of how to build in wood is, is a quite um, uh, um, nowadays question, I think, because a lot of things are being built in wood. Or some of the buildings, you don't even see that they are built in wood, for example. Mm. So this is another point. I mean, yeah, if, I, if you have to build with a... Uh, insulation outside i mean i can't show that either and then i try to make something out of it that looks more rich but if i can build in wood i try to show the wood and take the qualities of the wood to appear also and because they are very um yeah human close human um close to human beings i think it's touchable it smells good and all that Hmm. Yeah. I think this uh, note also on um, sustainability, which is uh, also a topic that apart from analysis, we discuss very much at ah. the Royal Academy oh. these days. Okay. Um, that's a very good, um, a good uh, place to, to finish uh, this uh, session. Uh, mm -hmm. It's now um, five o'clock uh, here in uh, Copenhagen. Mm -hmm. um, so I would like to say um, thank you to Nikolai for uh, contributing with this, uh, with your questions and um, uh, considerations uh, on the work. Uh, but first of all, thank you very, very much, uh, Aita Fluri, for your uh, lecture. It, uh, as mentioned, truly is a, a contribution to, uh, to our discussions on analysis. Uh, so, um, yeah, we are very happy to have had you here today and uh, all the rest of my questions i think i'll have to search for uh, answers to that in all your books <laughs> so uh, <laughs> thank you uh, very much uh, and also thank you to everybody uh, listening to this